Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jen Leone. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at HPD. Um, I am responsible for many of the activities that happen at the agency, including development of the design guidelines and policies and programs that support the design guidelines um, and so on. Um, today, we're talking specifically about HPD's uh, recently published preservation design guidelines. Um, and really, the purpose is to introduce everybody to the content and the process um, and how the design guidelines work and answer some questions that uh, I'm sure a lot of people have, whether you've seen them or have not taken a close look yet. Um, so I will get started. Um, first, uh, by means of introduction, um, HPD has committed strongly to decarbonization. Um, obviously, this is a really critical goal um, that New York City has been pursuing through laws and rules and policy, um, as well as New York State. Um, in Mayor Adams' uh, Blueprint for Housing, released earlier on or last year, um, HPD made a very specific commitment to fast track equitable decarbonization and beneficial electrification for low income households. Um, we are really committed to making sure that there is a just transition from a fossil fueled economy um, that is really important in the work that we do. And we want to make sure that while we are decarbonizing, we're doing it fairly um, for our residents. Um, a couple things in particular that were spotlighted in the Blueprint for Housing were incubating new ideas to scale beneficial electrification and resiliency and also to release sustainable design guidelines um, to set a path for how we could do that. Our plan for decarbonization is a plan to ensure that HPD and all of our projects are complying with the city's goals of an 80% uh, carbon reduction by 2050. And we are doing that through the design guidelines, which um, we released in 2023 and will be increasingly stringent um, as we move toward these goals with the goal of meeting the city's um, 2030 goals and all of the additional goals along the way. Um, the outcome, as I mentioned, is a 40% reduction by 2030 and an 80% uh, reduction by 2050. And this is noteworthy because affordable housing is treated differently under Local Law 97 in particular. Um, hopefully people have seen this slide or similar version of this before. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to translate uh, local law 97 and how it affects affordable housing and our design guidelines. You know, I just realized I'm going to turn off my video because I know it'll freeze. Um, our design guidelines are designed to ensure that projects can um, meet local law 97 compliance requirements. Um, and just to break it down a little bit and remind people what they're all about for affordable housing, um, I will note there's links to most of these resources in our design guidelines and in this slide deck. So just take note of that. Um, I think most people are familiar with this, but a lot of HPD projects are subject to the prescriptive path, um, which requires buildings that are HDFC co-ops have more than 35% of units subject to rent regulation or are particip excuse me, participate in a federal project-based housing program, um, have to meet, uh, ha either have to implement prescriptive measures or meet um, 2030 emissions limits um, at some point in the near future. Um, I'm going to skip over the middle path, the 2026 path that doesn't affect most of our projects. Um, and then the 2035 path, the green path, focuses mostly on Mitchell Lama projects that don't otherwise fall into the prescriptive path. And these buildings will have to start meeting emissions limits in 2035. So this is really important framing for the design guidelines because that's when projects come through our preservation programs and have 
funding available to meet these and other goals. Just to kind of put everything into context, HPD has always had a fairly rich sustainability framework. Um, and it, uh, if anybody's not muted, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so our projects are separated into new construction and then three different rehab classifications, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. Um, our rehab projects um, generally have an integrated physical needs assessment or for some of them, a building inspection. They are now subject to design guidelines for preservation. That is new for HPD. Um, and then sub and gut rehabs then also are required to comply with Enterprise Green or LEED Gold. Uh, new construction does not have an integrated physical needs assessment, of course, um, but has its own set of design guidelines, um, follows Enterprise Green, and then all of our projects uh, are required to benchmark. So finally, we get to the preservation design guidelines themselves. Um, these were released at the end of February 2023. Um, we have a web page. Um, the link is at the bottom. There's a lot of information on the web page. We're trying to make sure that it's very clear what the guidelines are about, who it applies to, when it applies, how to get all of the information, including the guidelines themselves. And it's all on the page. This is just a fragment of what you'll find on the web page. Couple key things, the guidelines are effective as of March 1st, 2023, um, and they apply to all new HPD preservation projects. And that also includes projects that are in HPD's pipeline that haven't yet been assigned to an HPD project manager. If you have a project in any of HPD's preservation programs that has been sitting around for a while and maybe doesn't have a project manager for some reason, um, you can contact HPD and find out what the situation might be. Um, but this is really geared toward projects that are that are new. Um, it's also it has somewhat limited applicability, as many of you know who do work with HPD. We do once in a while end up with projects that are really like just simple maintenance items or have a single scope, right? Maybe it's a boiler replacement. And that's unusual for projects coming through our preservation programs, but it does happen, especially on like large Mitchell Lama projects. The design guidelines are for projects that affect two or more systems. Um, and that's when the guidelines go into effect. Um, systems being heating, plumbing, electric roof, windows, um, and so on. Projects that are not subject to the guidelines are um, required to follow the applicable requirements only for that section. So if, if you're coming in just to do windows, you'd have to meet the window um, prescriptive requirements. And all projects that come through our preservation requirements do need to do the work necessary to meet uh, the requirements of Local Law 97. We have um, two booklets. Uh, we decided it would be much easier for everybody if we split the guidelines uh, by moderate rehab and sub and gut rehabs. Moderate rehab projects, reminder, are not subject to Enterprise Green. So the guidelines are more extensive. They cover all of these um, scope items that um, are not otherwise addressed. This is a lot of scope that we've been doing historically through our preservation programs, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but the goal is to ensure that all projects coming through are meeting best practices for um, building efficiency, health, safety, resiliency, and so on. Um, our substantial rehabs and gut rehabs are, again, because they're subject to Enterprise Green or LEED already, They've already been doing a much more significant level of renovation work. And because Enterprise Green is very holistic, a lot of the requirements in the mod rehabs are not going to show up in this booklet because it's already covered elsewhere. This is something we know has been confusing. Um, HPD has had a definition of substantial rehabs, which reminder, is the trigger for requiring Enterprise Green or LEED on our projects. Um, 
the city has revised local laws 31 and 32 somewhat, or, or is in the process, I should say. Um, that is where the definition of substantial rehab is generated. It's not our definition, it's the city's. Um, but again, it's very, very minor um, language change. But the way we, we wanted to make sure this was very clear to everybody because it differentiates what path projects have to follow. As I mentioned before, a moderate rehab is a project with two or more, or that affects two or more systems um, and isn't just simply a maintenance project. That is everything that would fall under the mod rehab guidelines. Um, substantial rehabs, on the other hand, follow the requirements listed here. So all three of these items must be included in the scope. A heating system replacement, and that is a heating system. It's not a boiler. It's the equipment and the distribution system. Work in at least 75% of dwelling units, and it's kind of any kind of work at all. It's, you know, even just a simple fixture replacement would trigger that. And substantial work on the building envelope, and this is where the city has cleaned up the definition of sub rehabs a little bit. So it's replacement or alteration of 50% or more of the total glazing area or 50% or more of the total opaque envelope, so roof, walls, and so on. These projects must comply with the design guidelines for substantial rehabs and certify with Enterprise Green. Gut rehabs is a relatively new term for HPD. This is really projects that are leaving very little. You know, the building shell and structural system, um, typically the tenants would be relocated during a project like this. We do some of these projects. The reason we're defining them as gut rehab is to make sure that we're really putting into place the most ambitious decarbonization goals because this is where the opportunity is the best. These buildings typically have very few, if any, systems remaining at all when they get retrofit. Um, one thing you'll notice in looking at the guidelines is we have these blue and orange flags. Um, and these are alerts. These are really important to note. Um, they call up certain policy or other, uh, other flags for users. In this case, you'll see that we are alerting people that certain work scopes may change the rehab classification. So a moderate rehab project that might trigger electrification in the design guidelines, um, if it's electrification of a heating system, that might push a project into a sub rehab classification. Um, and we want owners to be aware of that because we allow for waivers on certain criteria. And we wanna make sure people know like, hey, this is really not a feasible requirement. We can't trigger sub rehabs. The budget doesn't allow that. Um, so we wanna make sure people are thinking about that as they use the design guidelines to scope a project. Also structurally in our design guidelines, you'll see that we have baseline requirements and reach criteria. So it's a whole list um, under eight different sections of requirements that are mandatory. And in each category, you'll see reach criteria. These are optional, but they represent the best practices for that specific criteria area. Um, these are items that might become mandatory in the future, and we're testing them out. Um, these are criteria that we'd love to see on projects, but we know they're not all feasible for most projects. And architects and designers and owners can choose individual REACH criteria or follow out an overall REACH third-party certification, which covers you know, many criteria. Again, you'll see calling out here that there are flags. So in certain requirements, you'll see a flag that maybe notes, you know, something must require with HPD's electric heating policy um, or something else. I mentioned design waivers. This is really important. We know that our guidelines are ambitious. Um, you can't do ambitious without allowing for some release. Um, or relief from the criteria. So we are allowing design waivers on certain critical criteria in the guidelines. And this is true of both moderate rehabs and sub and gut rehabs. Um, this is 
important because some projects might not be able to accommodate particularly uh, electrification requirements, um, either because it's costly, it would trigger some kind of structural changes, it might trigger tenant hardship, or maybe there's a better way to do something than what we've proposed. It's really important that project teams understand that these waivers must be sought ahead of scoping the project. We don't expect to see projects come to us and having assumed waivers that we might not grant. It's really important that this is taken care of ahead of time so projects can seamlessly scope out a project either with or without a certain requirement. We have a waiver request form um, in the works. It's not on, available yet on our website. And it allows for applicants to select certain criteria that can be waived that are flagged in the guidelines for technical infeasibility, financial infeasibility. And we know this is a big one. This could be cost effectiveness, budget, availability of incentives, making the certain measure um, not pencil out. It might impact operational costs, right? If we have an electrification requirement that will drive um, building operation costs up, we don't necessarily think that it's a good idea. And we're looking at applicants to make that case. And again, I mentioned this before, if a criteria would cause a project to be reclassified, from like a mod rehab to a sub, and that's not feasible, we want to know, and we will allow waivers for that. Um, also noting again, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot, because so much of this, the big stuff is predicated on building electrification, but if a system cannot comply with HPD's electric heating policies, it will be waived, and I'll talk more about them later. I won't go deeply into this piece of the guidelines, but we talk about the integrated physical needs assessment, um, how current they need to be, and how items in the IPNA need to be factored into the scope. Um, but I don't want to cover that particularly now. It's all um, visible when you go and open up the guidelines. Um, again, we're also noting that local law 97 compliance, which there's a new tab in the 2023 IPNA, uh, sorry, in the 2022 IPNA um, for uh, local law 97 compliance that allows applicants to look building by building and figure out how they each building will achieve uh, compliance, um, each applicable building, I should say. Um, so this is really important. We think of the guidelines um, as doing a number of things for our projects. We're hoping that it increases transparency on what HPD wants to see for our projects. Um, up until now, our moderate rehabs haven't had anything like this. And we understand that it's difficult to scope a project if you don't know what HPD is looking for. Either you might overshoot or undershoot, and that makes it really challenging and complicated to design an appropriate project um, for our programs. We think the design guidelines will really help kind of set the standards, set the requirements, um, and make it easier to get through an HPD scoping process. But it's really important that folks use the guidelines to scope the project. Um, this is a really informative tool. It would be really difficult to design a project and then come to the design guidelines at the end to say, all right, did I do it? No, look at this, look at the guidelines, um, look at them early and understand what's required of a project scope. That'll also help the project determine if any waivers are needed up front. Um, our flowchart kind of outlines how we expect people will use the guidelines. Obviously, the first step is the integrated physical needs or building inspection. But then we are really strongly recommending that, especially folks who are new to this, um, check and figure out which rehab classification is applicable to this project. Um, is it a moderate rehab or is it a sub or gut? Because that will define which scope items are going to be required. Some of that is iterative. As I mentioned, there might be something in the moderate rehab guidelines that push a project into a substantial rehab, but figure that out early. Um, at that point, the consultant will review the applicable design guidelines and again, 
that white bubble suggests if there's something in there that suggests the classification is wrong, then there's an opportunity to seek a waiver and get back into the right classification that's appropriate. Um, and that is done by submitting a design waiver request. I showed that document on the previous page. And we're also offering applicants a chance to just have a pre-designed consultation request. So if you're an architect or an owner and you really don't know where your project should fall, whether electrification could be waived for a project or what your project should be doing, you can let us know and we can talk teams through it. We, we're hoping that'll be a really helpful new step in the process for rehabs. And then finally, once this is all uh, determined, the consultant can develop the scope of work based on the needs outlined in the IPNA, as well as the requirements in the guidelines. So content, this is really important. What's in the design guidelines? Um, some of you um, on this call were participated in the creation of the design guidelines. Not everybody has. So I'm going to start with the section one, the core requirements. And I realize now it would have been really useful to show you. And I'm going to skip ahead for a second. There's eight sections in each version of the design guidelines, starting with section one core requirements. But since those are so important, I'm going to talk about them first. Um, so this, there's a very parallel structure between the mods and the subs and the guts um, for core requirements. So for mods, first one is green building standard. And here you can see the baseline requirement as well as the reach criteria under each section. Um, no third party certification is required for mod rehabs. But a project could, we don't expect this will happen much, but a project could design and certify with Enterprise Green. This might be the case on a multi-building project where some of the projects do trigger um, Enterprise Green and the rest of them could follow along voluntarily, certify or not. Um, greenhouse gas emissions. This is a big one. It's really important that our buildings are in compliance with Local Law 97. Even for projects where penalties haven't really been articulated, we want to be sure that that doesn't happen or that a project isn't penalized for integrating prescriptive measures, if that's the appropriate pathway. So all projects have to submit the Local Law 97 compliance tab from the IPNA to demonstrate how each building or each project will meet the applicable requirements. For buildings subject to the prescriptive pathway, the buildings can demonstrate that they're um, implementing all the applicable prescriptive energy conservation measures, or, and we strongly encourage this, that buildings be designed to meet or exceed the 2030 uh, greenhouse gas emissions limits. Most of our projects should easily get to that point by doing a pretty typical HPD scope, right? 2030 is not that hard to get to, except really buildings on oil. Um, for buildings subject to the 2035 pathway, this is like the Mitchell Llamas and another handful of income restricted buildings. We'd like to see these buildings designed to meet or exceed the 2035 greenhouse gas emissions limits and to the extent possible be designed to meet future limits after that point, like throughout the building's financing cycle. And this is important because if you get funding from HPD in 2025, you might not want to come back to us before 2040, which is the next compliance cycle. Arguably, this will not be easy, but we like people to be thinking about this when they come through our programs. Um, the reach criteria for this is to meet longer term emissions limits than is the bare minimum. 1.3 is energy use reductions. Um, certain of our programs require buildings to reduce energy use by 20%. A reach criteria would be for all buildings to meet at least 20% energy use reductions. And finally, electrification. This is the big ticket piece of the design guidelines and how we're gonna really get to these deeper decarbonization levels. Um, electrification is required in the mod rehabs in a very, very strategic and limited way. Um, electrification of heating systems um, that are currently on oil or electric resistance um, will be required to convert to heat pumps. 
um, or where the equipment is subject to um, flooding as outlined in chapter two. Um, we have a, a protocol for determining flood prone buildings, um, which looks to the 2050 um, sea level rise adjusted maps in the climate resiliency design guidelines. Um, this, uh, I, I know, I feel like somewhere in the design guidelines, I think it must be in chapter 3.1, we articulate that we only want to see electrification of heating if the building will be doing air sealing and replacing windows and roofs, or if the building already meets a pretty rigorous um, envelope that that is, a, you know, um, aligning with current code. We do not want to see poorly designed electrification projects. Noting here that this would be a place we expect that we will see waiver requests, it's not going to be that easy to electrify a moderate rehab. Um, I will talk about our electri retrofit electrification pilot a little bit later on in this presentation and a little bit more on that then. Um, for sub and gut rehabs, um, the requirements for green building standards are enterprise green or lead gold, but we encourage projects to design to enterprise green plus, uh, lead platinum or zero, or enterfit. For greenhouse gas emissions, these buildings are doing much more work. We, are, we do not allow for buildings to do the prescriptive pathway um, that are sub and gut rehabs. They should be designed to at least meet the 2030 greenhouse gas emissions limits. The 2035 pathway buildings, the income restricted and Mitchell Lamas, should be designed to meet 2035 at least, preferably 2040 um, and beyond. Um, energy use reductions, we're deferring to Enterprise Green for that, although we have created a REACH EUI of 42 kBTU per square foot. Um, and as for electrification, the goal is to be more ambitious than the MOD rehabs. So for sub-rehabs, same requirements as the MOD, the MODs, um, but in addition, uh, where steam heating systems are being significantly altered or replaced altogether, um, we are requiring electrification. Also, domestic hot water systems and buildings under seven stories. Um, now, this is important here. We, the reason we have the steam heating systems is because we don't want to see significant investment in heating systems that can't be electrified in the future. We do expect to see waiver requests for projects uh, proposing a steam to hydronic upgrade, which could be electrified in the future. And that would be, again, another waiver that we would consider. Um, also, uh, for projects where there's a significant reason to upgrade appliances to electric and particularly cooking um, where electrification upgrades in unit are already happening for other reasons or if gas line replacements are so significant that it doesn't make sense we'd like to see those buildings electrify appliances and for gut rehabs full electrification is the goal again knowing that projects may wave out of that requirement for some reason or another um, and for those projects, they need to be designed to be electric ready. Not that we expect a project to come in with a brand new steam heating system, but we wouldn't allow something like that for that reason. And when we say all electric, which we refer to in the REACH standard, we are excluding emergency generators, which we don't have a really good path to electrify at the moment. Um, so the rest, um, the electrification and the core requirements are really the big ticket items. Um, this is a brief outline of what else is included um, for content in the guidelines. So I'll skip section one. Resiliency. Um, again, we're focused on mod rehabs on this slide. We would like to see new equipment in flood prone areas in the 2050s 1% floodplain um, to be elevated. New equipment should be up on the roof. That's why the electrification requirement is applicable there. If not, we'd like to see it flood proof. We really want to be sure that since we have these great maps that are, you know, looking into the real flood that 
real flooding we're expected to see from sea level rise and um, inland storm flooding. We'd like to protect our investments that way. In addition, backwater valves, flood resistant materials, flood insurance and flood notifications to tenants is required. Um, and in terms of resiliency for heating, outlets are required so that uh, residents can plug in air conditioning. Um, but for seniors, we're requiring that cooling be provided um, and also in, and cool roofs also be installed uh, just to keep buildings cooler. Um, some, but not all of the REACH criteria. Um, you know what, I feel like I've got somebody's picture here that shouldn't be there. Um, uh, the noteworthy REACH criteria is to eliminate res residential uses below grade. We know that's tricky, which is why it's not required at this time. Flood sensors and shaded outdoor space. The HVAC chapter is very prescriptive. Um, we have very uh, specific requirements on top of the electrification for equipment being replaced, prescriptive measures for systems and equipment not being replaced, and this is obviously heating, ventilation, hot water, um, air conditioning. And finally, for ventilation, clean seal and balance existing ventilation and add window screens. I'm not going to, I'll let you guys look at the REACH criteria. I don't need to read them out because um, I want to focus on what's mandatory for now. Um, chapter four, sustainability and efficiency. These are prescriptive requirements for air sealing, insulation and in existing cavities that are accessible, um, window and roof specifications when these items are being replaced. Um, same thing for low flow fixtures. Um, common area and in-unit lighting improvements, common area lighting and sensors being mandatory um, because it's easy and it's a good idea, um, and a requirement for appliances being replaced. Now, again, these should look pretty familiar. This is what we've been doing for projects for many years, uh, but not specifically on paper. Um, also, this is where we refer to HPD's solar where feasible mandate, um, which requires feasibility analyses for solar on all of our rehab projects, and where the payback is uh, 10 years or less, solar should be installed. Um, health and wellness chapter has healthy material specifications. This is what we already have in the HPD uh, rehab specs. Um, some requirements around waste management, uh, as well as moisture and mold, pest management, and a smoke-free policy. And we've also outlined certain requirements for asbestos and lead. These are city laws. There's nothing new here, but it's just a reminder to folks when they're scoping what they'll have to be subject to. Um, a new chapter on access, a new chapter, a chapter on accessibility and aging. Um, HPD's projects have already required certain accessibility requirements to comply with city, state, and federal laws. But also there are aging in place surveys, and this is where those items get um, incorporated into the scope. We now require broadband in common areas, and this is one reach criteria that I'm noting is free broadband in apartments, similar to what is now required on HPD new construction. And operations, um, this is project manuals and staff and resident training, very similar to what is outlined in Enterprise Green. Um, we do need to make sure that the investments we make in systems and buildings are articulated to the people who are living in them and managing them. Otherwise, it's a, you know, a real loss of all the work that's gone into the building. And finally, noteworthy appendix, we have a whole series of appendices, but appendix A outlines very specific performance requirements for um, heating hot and hot water systems, both electric and not. And a note that our specifications are designed to align with the incentive programs. We no longer want to see projects coming in with a new, whether it's a boiler or heat pump, but that cannot apply for the available incentives. It doesn't make any sense. For sub and gut rehabs, the list, as I said, is a little bit shorter because we're working around enterprise green communities. Um, core requirements I've already covered. Um, resiliency is very similar to the mod rehabs, except that um, we are requiring where space is available 
Um, a place of refuge, which is a common area with heating, cooling, lighting, and so on, that has backup power for buildings with 50% or more seniors. Uh, this is important. This population is really at risk from increasing heat, and we want to the extent we can to protect them. And also cooling for seniors, as we're requiring for the mod rehabs. HVAC, I've already talked about the electrification requirements um, that is different for subs and guts. It's outlined again in Chapter 3. Mechanical ventilation is required, which most of you know who've worked on Enterprise Green projects. And then for the most part, um, chapters four through eight are primarily covered by Enterprise Green with a few additional items um, threaded through that, you know, we just want to make sure are integrated. Um, one thing I'll note um, that I put up, there's an orange uh, footnote at the bottom denoting which projects, uh, sorry, which criteria are eligible for design waivers. It's important, we don't expect that the mandatory requirements are waived unless they are waivable. I'm not going to go in depth. I just wanted to show everybody what we have in our appendices. There's been a lot of effort put in to make sure that these are really tight specifications. So you'll see um, high performance electric heating equipment specifications, COPs, um, reference to NEEP cold climate product list. Um, a note on electric resistance backup, which is not permitted. Um, BACnet capable equipment, um, a reference to HPD's technical requirements for heat pumps. We have developed a, a number of these resources through our pilot. Um, and then sizing um, and an allowance for certain electric resistance equipment in limited quantities in bathrooms and stairwells and so on. Similar requirements for DHW systems and non-electric heating equipment where electrification is not required. I'm not going to read it out. It's pretty obvious. We have, as, as you've noted, noticed, we refer to path to electrification and electric readiness. So we have some guidance on how to achieve that um, for our buildings. And finally, we have a um, matrix that we've been working on through our retrofit pilot to help folks new to heat pumps and electrification try and think through how you might select a heat pump system for a rehab project. I'm not going to dive into that deeply, but just want to note that it's there because we've been learning a lot as we navigate through this complicated pilot. That was a lot on the guidelines themselves. I want to talk very briefly about some of the other um, things that we have and initiatives we have to make sure that the guidelines can be implemented. I think most people are familiar with our retrofit electrification pilot that launched a year and a half ago, $24 million joint effort between us and NYSERDA that incense electrification on HPD projects. These are projects in our preservation pipeline. We currently have about, I think, 14 projects in the pipeline, one of them under construction currently, and a few, a handful set to close this fall. Um, these will be funded up to a million dollars per project um, for electrification. There's also technical support and so on to these projects. So it's a really rich incentive. Um, more details can be found on our retrofit electrification pilot page, including how to apply if you have a project in our pipeline um, that will be seeking uh, electrification. But there's also a lot of other resources available, including technical requirements, FAQs, best practices, and so on that anybody can use. We have a web page that uh, clearly articulates our electric heating policy. This is a policy we've been developing as electrification is scaling up in new construction and now is becoming applicable across preservation. Um, our I'm not going to go into this in great depth, but we talk about which electric heating systems are and are not allowed on HPD subsidized project. Um, we don't allow shitty electric resistance equipment like electric PTEX 
that are not cold climate. Um, we do have different requirements for inclusionary housing and 421A programs where we don't have the same jurisdiction over. Um, we allow resident paid electric heat, but only in very particular cases in new construction and even more restricted cases on uh, retrofits. Anybody who's tried to do electrification and affordable housing knows there's a lot of challenges, especially around rent stabilized projects where you'd have to be shifting heating costs typically from owner to residents. Heat pumps can be configured in a number of ways. They provide heating and cooling. It's not easy. This is where our guidance is made the most clear. Um, and it talks about the hows and the whens um, that electrification would be allowed and refers to additional documents. It's really complicated um, as anybody who's in our retro, retrofit electrof electrification projects know. Um, I noted before, Preservation Design Guidelines webpage, there's a ton of information on here, um, including um, upcoming resources that I'll go into in a minute. Reminder that HPD's sustainability webpage has a lot of other resources. Almost anything you need to know about our programs can be found here. Enterprise Green Communities, the protocols, the documents, the resources, Solar Were Feasible program, benchmarking program, green communities training, additional resources for architects and owners. It's all here. This is the go-to place. It's where pretty much everything you'll ever need to know is linked to. And finally, we have supporting documentation for the guidelines coming soon. We're actively working on the tools and submission documents that'll make all of this hopefully much easier for everybody internally to HPD and externally. So we've got design guidelines checklists. We know everybody wants to, you know, leaf through our design guidelines book, which is really pretty and elegant, but it's long. Um, We've created a checklist to help architects and designers scope the projects, make sure that they know in short form what's mandatory, what's waivable, and what's reach. Um, also, we'll require this checklist to make sure that the applicants are actually going through the full set of guidelines and including them where they're necessary and providing HPD with critical information about the projects. We've got the design waiver request. It's not up on our website yet, but this is the easy way to request a waiver and the only way to request a waiver. And finally, all projects will be required to submit a project summary early on in the game. This will be great to help HPD project managers understand projects right off the bat, identify if there's any red flags like project in flood zone, project seeking waivers, projects doing electrification and so on. And it's a really good way to help our internal teams understand what the project is all about. Um, not always easy if you're a finance person not used to reading architectural drawings and IPNAs. We will be creating some additional resources, um, things like how to assess if electrification will drive up costs for your project. If you're seeking a waiver, that might be good information to know. This is an example calculator that helps try and compare um, different heating systems to a heat pump with you know, different levels of envelope improvement. Also, um, budgets cooling, uh, which might be useful for a heat pump project as well. Um, a question I saw in the chat, um, we are working with Enterprise right now. Um, we will be releasing in the very near future an updated New York City overlay so that our rehab and upcoming new construction design guidelines requirements are stitched together and very clear. We want to minimize conflict there and make sure that, you know, everybody's on the same page um, and so on with that. Before I pivot over to questions, just wanted to thank everybody who's on this call who participated in this um, really elaborate and lengthy process of getting our design guidelines developed and refined. Um, so thanks if you're on the call from HPD, 
NYSAFA or any of the other sister agencies. Um, really appreciate all of the work. Um, this is a big deal. Hopefully, it will change the way we do business um, across HPD. Next thing, it's not on here, but stay tuned. Um, HPD will be releasing new construction design guideline updates these this summer, um, but we will be releasing some key initiatives from the sustainability side of the design guidelines in the next month or so. So please stay tuned. Um, this is where you'll see items like electrification for new construction and a couple other really critical decarbonization initiatives. That is it. That was a lot of talking on my part. Um, so I'm going to look into the chat, but if anybody wants to jump on and ask some questions, I'm happy to do that. But I think I better start with the chat because there's a ton of questions in here. So we'll the, the recording should be accessible so long as I didn't mess that up. That's happened before. Um, I just noticed I've been sharing the presenter screen the whole time. Um, I hope that's not true, but it seems like it was, and I apologize for that. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Inspe uh, are there guidelines for the building inspection report? Um, not as part of the design guidelines. Um, I assume that BUILDS has requirements for a building inspection report for the gut rehabs. This has been standard practice for a long time, but I don't have that information in the design guidelines. Um, next question, will HPD apply for design waivers on HPD provided scope like in the GHPP program? I don't understand what that question is. So if anybody wants to, uh, it was... Bud Heileman, who asked. Yeah, no, it's um, uh, the question. When you were going over the design waivers, you were talking about um, scopes of work. There are times that HPD will issue a scope of work. Um, will the design waivers be considered within that scope? You know, like in the Greenhouse Preservation Program. So that's a good question. The design guidelines are applicable to all projects, but this presentation was really focused on architect scoped projects, right? Um, which architect or consultant, I should say, HPD is moving toward a protocol where we are not scoping our own projects. Those are traditionally limited to projects without um, significant needs or HVAC system conversions. Um, but I think for a project that would be a build scoped project, we'll have to see how that plays out. If a project comes in and it's on oil, what that likely will mean is that it's going to need a consultant anyway, and we'll have to go through a consultant process. And then if the consultant will handle a waiver, uh, a waiver if it's necessary. HPD can't scope an electrification project without an architect. Okay. I Thank hope you. that answered the question. It's not always super transparent, we know. Um, I see another question. I understand that Passive House is an acceptable alternate path to Enterprise Green or LEED, correct? That is not true. We do not, the city does not allow us to accept Passive House in lieu of Enterprise Green or LEED. Um, for a project that is doing Passive House, and we are not seeing very many of those in our preservation pipeline, that would be in addition to Enterprise Green. Passive House doesn't cover the full gamut of measures that Enterprise Green and LEED does. Part of me wishes that we could do it that way, but the city made those rules. Um, is HPD working with FDNY and others um, about uh, emergency backup battery storage? Yes, we are. Um, we and everybody else that is interested in this. Um, we'll keep you posted if we learn anything. Next question, waivers. When the utility companies, Con Ed or National Grid, cannot provide the electrical loads, yes. If, if a project can demonstrate with a load letter um, 
that they cannot provide the appropriate load, that would be a, a good excuse for a waiver. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm reading this question again. In addition, right, not both utilities will not provoke blah, 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 future electric loads. Yes, we have heard anecdotally that the utilities are not willing to provide additional service for future loads. I've also heard conflicting information on that. Should a project wish to uh, design for future electric readiness and the utility won't provide that availability, then we won't expect that it will be done, at least in terms of uh, like load, uh, sorry, service provided. But there are other electrification readiness um, items that can be implemented without the service. Um, are enterprise green requirements up to date with the new design guidelines? I think I just answered that. We're working to get those aligned right now. Stay tuned. Um, confirm that HPD LIHTC year 15 program applications are subject. Again, if a year 15 project is affecting two or more systems, then yes, it would be subject to the design guidelines. If it's a LIHTC uh, project that is not, is you know, it's just like a standalone or maintenance or single system project, it would not. I hope I answered that question accurately. There might be certain projects that are really just a tax abatement that would have to be dealt with uh, with program directly. Um, can an owner chosen funding program determine that a building follow requirements outside of the rehab path? I don't understand this question. Um, the example is the project is mod rehab, but the funding program requires the project follow Enterprise Green. Uh, this is Jiro Baskin. Do you want to um, yeah, clarify Yeah, so this, this has happened on projects where uh, we're approached by an owner with a funding program that they've you know discussed with HPD. That funding program and all the requirements says that it has to follow Enterprise Green Communities, but it's a moderate rehab and shouldn't necessarily have to do Enterprise Green Communities. And it's been confusing at times when that happens. That's a great example. I think if the next time that happens, um, that should be brought up to the program and myself. It could be just a misinterpretation. Um, somehow that like the program term sheet isn't correctly aligned with the requirements. Um, so we'll have to solve that on a case-by-case -case basis. I've never seen that happen, but that doesn't mean it doesn't. Understood. Um, we are around where, you know, our team is here to kind of assist and make sure that we get the best outcomes for our project. Best outcomes could be, you know, a very low carbon, high performance building. It could be an appropriate scope for a particular building that meets the project's funding requirements and is addressing the baseline requirements for health, energy, and efficiency. Any other questions? It's almost two. I think I gave our I gave us an hour and a half hoping we wouldn't need the full amount of time. Happy to stay here and talk one-on-one -on -one about um, any questions. Um, if they're not, you know, if people start to or want to take off from this presentation. Anything else? I have, a, this is Jero again. I have another question related to builds. Mm -hmm. um, is builds revamping in any way how they are reviewing projects and materials that are being specified? Because we run into a lot of issues where um, we use a form of master spec. We use, for example, a very typical white subway tile, but it's rejected simply because it's not a four by four inch white tile. And we're not really sure why, because it provides the same function, but our projects are being rejected because it's not following the HPD specifications that they would use for their projects. That's a great question that I can't answer, um, but I will make note of that. Um, and bring it to our builds team. It seems like they're trying to govern aesthetics by that particular subway tile issue. 
Um, but I'll note that. And if anything comes up, again, can't promise that we can resolve all issues across the agency, but mm -hmm. we can help advocate for things that make sense. Is there any, do you know if there's any uh, push to update some of the specifications? Because the other issue we run into is specification, specifications regarding kitchen and bathroom sinks, which, because there's very specific dimensions and sizes and functions and nothing in the uh, in the industry can we find completely meets all of the requirements. And when we're being asked, does this material meet all of the requirements, we can't technically say yes. I don't really understand how people are getting around it or where they're finding these materials because we've called a number of different things. Right. They don't match. That's a great question. Again, I know that the builds team is working on updating all the specifications as needed to align with the guidelines, right? We don't have all the heat pump specifications we need. I only deal with sustainability. Um, however, uh, I'll bring this up as an issue with the team and try and figure out if there's a better way to handle this. Um, it would seem like either that's a, a new specification required or some back and forth across the industry to find products that meet HPD's specifications. We're interested in that anyway, as we start moving toward more sustainable materials, um, right? That, that as mm -hmm. we develop new specifications, anything that our, you know, partner architects and design teams come up with, you know, we'd love to have open source lists to help all the the industry um, get there, but I'll see what I can do. I can't promise anything since it's outside of my jurisdiction. Understood. Thank we you. understand that it's not always 100% smooth to work with government agencies on this stuff, but we can try to make it easier. Um, I'm going to pivot. Matt has a question about compartmentalization in the design guidelines. No. Um, Projects that would be subject to compartmentalization would be our substantial and gut rehabs. Because Enterprise Green covers that, we did not specifically put it into our guidelines. Um, we hear from the industry that compartmentalization and testing is extremely difficult for tenant pl in place uh, projects. Um, we're working with Enterprise Green to develop a prescriptive pathway that might skirt some of those complexities on applicable projects, so stay tuned. Um, but the answer is no. Anything else? It's exactly two o'clock which is kind of amazing if we end exactly at two, but I'm, like I said, I'm sticking around if anyone has other questions. I think nobody does. Um, you know, what I should do is, I'm gonna put my email in here. I think most people know it, but. Jen, um, people also asked about just sharing the presentation and the recording. Um, so is that just some, did yes. you have their emails through the Zoom? Not being a Zoom expert, I believe I can get the invitation list and forward um, mm -hmm. the PDFs and make the recording available. Um, so stand by, it might take me a day or two to get that coordinated. I may have to add a slide or two that I realized I missed as I was talking um, as well. <laughs> Anything else? I just put my email in the chat. Um, feel free to reach out. That's the best way to find me. Um, and if anybody has any other kind of issues or recommendations, not necessarily to change the guidelines at the moment, but for anything else, let us know. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, look forward to seeing new projects come through the guidelines. Um, and widespread decarbonization of affordable housing. All right. Thank you. Oh, something else? Great. I'm going to.
exit and stay 